the second Anglo sequel. It's a conflict that has not been discussed on this channel until now. Hi guys and welcome back to the fourth and final installment of my short series with Chris Bryce on the life of Sir Hugh Gough, General Sir Hugh Gough, that Irish lion of the Napoleonic and Victorian era. In the last episode, we looked at Gough's performance during the First Anglo-Sikh War of 1845-46. to That is a fascinating conflict, and if you haven't watched that video, I highly recommend going back and doing so to catch up ready for this one. It's 1848. Gough, now Baron Gough, is once more still in command of the British and East India Company forces in the region. Despite the British victory in the First Anglo-Sikh War, trouble is brewing again just a few short years later. Chris Bryce, author of the book on Sir Hugh Gough, picks up the story. The incident that starts it is at Multan, where the Sikh government, um, under British influence, uh, tries to change the governor of Multan. Um, and there is a rebellion against uh, the two officers who are sent uh, and the governor and Basically. Agnew, was it Van Ag Van Ag uh, Vans Agnew and uh, Lieutenant William Anderson? That was the go. other other officer. Um, and from there, you know, you get the siege of Mul uh, Multan by the the, the wonderful uh, Lieutenant Edwards, um, who just it, it is a fascinating character in his own right. Um, and so, you know, <clears throat> this second. Uh, conflict starts. We have a different governor general by this time, um, uh, the Earl of Dalhousie. Um, and he's different from Hardinger in many ways. He's not a military man, although his father was a military man. And But he is a great friend, follower, confidant of the Duke of Wellington. So there's still this great influence of the Duke of Wellington with, with, with Dalhousie during the um, during the conflict. Um, we get a bizarre situation here where Dalhousie, for some reason, just before the conflict, has renewed Gough's period of command, even though Gough wanted to return to England. Uh, even though Dalhousie had his doubts about Gough, um, he decides to renew his period as commander in chief. Exactly why, I'm, I'm not entirely sure, and I don't I'm not entirely sure anyone's really knows the, the real reason for that, but there obviously I don't th I think I think he could see a second conflict coming and he didn't want a great change of leadership and you know to be criticized for well you got rid of the commander in chief just before the conflict and you know you brought in the new man and uh, inevitably he was having to start from scratch. Um whether that's the case or not, I don't know. But the second conflict is is much harder again for Gough because he's he's, he's being really severely limited by uh, in terms of preparations. Uh, Dalhousie is really trying to cut back on the costs of the army, so there have been uh, reductions before uh, the conflict in the intervening period, and it's really hard for for Gough to re to really sort of put together serious force and it takes him a long time um we get the sort of the uh, the aborted battles at uh, ramnagar and saddlepur uh in late uh, 1848 and then we move on to what is really the major first major battle of the campaign of the second anglo Sikh war um on uh, in uh, january 49 which is uh, chilamwala now, this is the only battle in Goff's entire career that you can say he didn't win. However, I would strongly deny any assertion that he lost it. It was a drawn battle. That, that's simply what it was. Um, I do think in some cases you do have to say that perhaps it broke the back of the Sikh army in some respects. Um, the Battle of Gujarat, uh, about a month later in February uh, 1849, is, a, is the final battle, and it's an overwhelming British victory, 
Although again, you know, British casualties aren't on exactly small, but that is because they're fighting the Sikhs, um, pure and simple. So I don't want to dwell on Chinnawalla for too long. It's not because I'm trying to overlook it, but I think it's been gone into many, many times before by many people. Um, there have been some nonsensical fantasies about Chilamwala um, that have been repeated and um, they were said at the time and some have been repeated in books fairly recently. Uh, I won't name the author, but there was one recently who, who reported this bizarre story of the time that after the Battle of Chilamwala, there was a move afoot to um, Court Martial Goff um, I mean, who, who sits on a court martial of the commander in chief? That's, a, that's an interesting question to start with. But it was nonsense. It was complete and utter nonsense. You do get a sense as well that the press, both in India and in London, and of course, we need to remember that things that are going on in London are behind events in India because of the, the space of time. It's about a month in terms of time uh, from getting reports from. India to London. And um, these are the days before the great sort of, you know, the telegraph system that could send messages back and forth in, in a day or so. Um, <clears throat> we, we're, we're talking about a, a month correspondence to get back and forth. And so London's reacting well after, you know, events have actually happened. I mean, the irony is when they send Napier out to take over, uh, Charles Napier to take over command of the army, Goff's already finished the war. The war is already over. Um, you know, Gujarat has been fought. Um, the Sikhs have, have, have all but surrendered. Well, just just quickly, Chris, at Chilean Walla, then what 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 did Goff do? Was it was it that old fashioned you know the tactics we've been discussing, fix bayonets and charge? Is that why he was so criticised? Um, what 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 did he do, sort of tactically? Do you think that that may have cost him the victory? Well, you know, you've said it in that sense that it was the, the, the bayonet charge, but in this case, there really is very little alternative. Th there was one, well, there was one very key alternative, which is that he shouldn't have fought the battle. Um, you know, the, the Sikhs were in a very strong position. The flank could not be turned, even if he had thought of that, because there was a very strong Sikh position that prevented that. Um, and the topography as well. Um, the artillery as well. I mean, th there's, there are reports from artillery officers who I think saying that they, um, they bested the Sikh artillery. Well, they didn't. They really didn't. And this idea that the Sikh guns had all been put out of action and, uh, you know, th they could just have carried on the bombardment that they were winning. <clears throat> one of the, the artillery officers said, well, we were winning the artillery duel and then the commander-in-chief stopped it. Well, they weren't. They really were not winning the artillery duel because really, with the exception of Gujarat, the British artillery didn't win an artillery duel in the entire campaign, both wars, to be quite frank. Um, and again, as I was explained earlier, you, know, you don't just look to the inferiority of British artillery, you look to this, how good Sikh artillery was as well. Not as good, I admit, in the second conflict as it was in the first. But, you know, he, he has a situation here where, and there is a sense in which that he had actually not intended to fight the battle that day. But then his men came under fire. And when your troops are under fire, you have a, as a commander, you have a quick decision to make. You either pull back or you attack. If your troops are under fire, you've got one or two choices. You either pull back out of range or you attack, really, if there's no suitable cover to take. Goff was not the sort of man who was going to pull back, certainly not in the face of the enemy, um, and certainly not once they had started firing. You know, that was the battle. So he committed his men in an attack. It's not just uh, Goff at Chilamwalla who, who makes mistakes. It's a bad day for the British Army in terms of various errors. There's the error with the cavalry, which I think is quite well known, which where they, they, they leave the field on mistaken orders and they, 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 they basically 
depart and uh, they start running away, etc. It's not a good day for British cavalry, uh, Chirnwala. Also, the, the normally reliable um, Colin Campbell, one, you know, later Baron Clyde, one of the, uh, the better uh, military commanders under, under Goff, uh, even he has a bad day and makes mistakes and errors. Um, it's just one of those days when nothing goes right. Um, that's because they shouldn't, as I say, probably have fought the battle on that day. Um, but to a man like Goff, you know, withdrawing in the face of the enemy would not have been something he would have yeah. thought. Um, and I don't think there were too many British military commanders of that period who would have done. Um, I can imagine Wellington doing it uh, and then thinking, no, we'll fight this another day. Or perhaps withdrawing and trying to lure the Sikhs onto him and then fighting back. But, you know, regardless of what we might think of his later career, Wellington is one of the great British military commanders. Um, he has a tactical nous, which is severely lacking in pretty much everyone else during this period. Um, so that might sound quite simplistic, but it isn't really in many senses. And again, we've got that tactical doctrine of India that you attack. Yeah. And so I think this is part of the problem at Chinnawalla. Well, so we, we we have essentially, from what you're saying, a bit of a, a bit of a stalemate, a bit of a score draw, is it, at Chile and Walla? Yes, yeah. I don't think I don't think in any way you can say it is a Sikh victory. Equally, I don't think you can say it's a British victory. Yeah. So there is only one, you know, solution in that sense. It's a draw, and it is a drawn battle. Yeah. But the reaction to this drawn battle uh, <clears throat> within India and also within Britain. Is just ridiculous. The, the press go berserk over it. They start all these, you know, that he's threatened, Goth has threatened the, the future of British India by not fighting a, a decisive battle. Um, you know, and, and they really stir up a lot of antagonism against Goth. There's also a sense in which the British Parliament and the government also gets rather carried away. Um, there are debates in the House of Commons and there's a move to um, replace Goff. And they send Charles Napier, you know, hurriedly out to, <clears throat> to India. Now, Charles Napier, let's put a little bit of context there. Napier had left India because he'd been severely criticised in the press. Napier was not popular in India, but he was sent out that, you know, Clearly, they saw this as an emergency. Whatever they tried to say afterwards, you wouldn't send Napier back to India unless it was an emergency. Um, and there's a, there's a quote uh, from the Duke of Wellington, because Napier didn't want to go. You know, he said, I've got too many enemies in India. This isn't going to work. Uh, and he said that to the Duke of Wellington. And Wellington's supposed to have said, well, either you go or I'll have to. <laughs> you know, and this is... This is a very old old uh, Duke of Wellington. Now, whether he, he really meant that or not is open to debate. I mean, it might just have been a way of illustrating to Napier how serious mm. uh, he perceived, perceived the situation to be. Um, but the daft thing is, all this talk of replacement and sending out Napier, etc., it, it, it's all irrelevant because the war's already over. And the war is now almost as good as over thanks to a crushing British victory at the Battle of Gujarat. That battle was fought on the 21st of February 1849. Once again the Sikhs were dug in in very strong positions. This time there was a big artillery duel and for once the British were able to win it. That was followed by a desperately brave bayonet charge by the infantry which ousted the Sikh defenders. The Sikh soldiers were pursued and broken over a number of kilometres. After that victory, the Punjab was soon formally annexed and a new era of Anglo-Sikh relations began. So Goff's essentially won the war, Napier's on his way out. Is this the end of Goff's career? Is he finally done? It is to a large extent. Um, um, part, of, part of the thing is that Goff at this stage, he knows there's been criticism of him in the press, but he expects little else and he doesn't read the press 
he says he's always made it a, a, you know, a, a point of, of uh, the way he does things, but he doesn't listen to what Chris is saying about him. Very sensible. Um, very sensible, yes, exactly. <laughs> it's a tricky situation for Goff. And, and, and originally, at, at first, he doesn't appreciate how things are being understood in London. He gets this letter from uh, the Duke of Wellington, which is rather rambling and not very clear, but basically says, oh, we're sending out Napier to take over from you when you retire. Because Goff technically should have retired by the time, you know, the war's being fought. Um, and his terms of service, you know, his length of service was over. So he should have gone. So Goff reads this letter and he just thinks, oh, they're sending Napier out to take over from me when I leave. That's mm, all. At some to, point in the future. At some point in the future. Um, and actually, there's something that Wellington writes as well, that Napier is there to, something like, to, to serve at your command until you think it, it's time for you to leave. It's a very confusing letter. Um, and one can completely understand why Goff doesn't quite understand that Goff, Napier is being sent out to replace him. Napier has very clear uh, instructions to replace him. But Napier is equally delighted when he gets there to realise that he doesn't have to, to replace him. And, and Napier acts with, with, with wonderful grace and, um, and, and, and charm and uh, is it, very kindly towards the Goffs because uh, he even refuses to take up his official residency because that would have left the Goffs without somewhere to go. And Napier says, no, I'll go and, you know, I don't know where he went. He found Diggs somewhere and uh, he left the Goffs in the, the official residency because, you know, he didn't need it and, and, and it would have put them to inconvenience. Um, it's only really later on that Goff starts to realise just how vitriolic the press has been, just how critical politicians have been of, of him. Um, he also starts reading the reports of the various uh, victories and uh, debates in the House of Lords. Um, he realises that for, for some of the battles, um, the Duke of Wellington actually gives him no credit at all. There's a speech on, and I think it's on Gujarat, in the House of Lords that Wellington gives. He doesn't mention Gough by name once. You know, he, he's lauding this British victory, but he doesn't mention Gough's name. He refers to the commander in chief, but he doesn't actually say Gough. He names other people. He names other individuals. He doesn't name Goff. Now, as we spoke in the first interview, does this go back to his, his long-standing dislike of, of Goff or whatever? I, I, we, we don't know. We don't know enough to, to say that. It's, there's a degree into which I think you can suggest that there's something going on there. Just quickly then, ha, um, did he die shortly after or did he live a long, fulfilling retirement? 1869. So he, he lived for, for many years um, after the conflict. Um, became quite an old man. He continued to receive honours. Um, he was uh, appointed a gold stick in waiting. Um, it's an interesting, there's an interesting little final element of his career. Um, during the Crimea War, you'll probably be aware that there's, there's great criticism of the leadership. And there's a bizarre situation where the Times, and there's an editorial in the Times, where they actually suggest that Goff might be the man to go out and lead the armies in the Crimea. Now, despite the fact he's far too old, it is bizarre that here is the paper that basically wanted him hung, drawn and quartered after Chilamwala, now suggesting he goes out and leads the, uh, you know, the campaign in the Crimea. Now, he does actually go briefly to the Crimea, but after the conflict, on official business as the representative of Her Majesty to give out the awards to French and British generals for their services during the Crimea. Um, and that's one of these, and it, it, it's a great period. It's a lovely little finish off for Goff in terms of service to the Crown because he is the Crown's representative. He is cre treated with all the respect and dignity and privileges that would be his if he was the king. Uh, he is, is, is honoured in such a, a wonderful way that he, 
he goes there as the official representative of Her Majesty and is treated, in effect, as if he were Her Majesty. Um, and it's a lovely little end to his terms of service, his period of service in, in that era. Now, I, I know this is something that we sort of suggested earlier, and he said about um, how he was respected by his men and, and what they thought of him. There's a little, there's a lovely little story um, when he is asked to review the troops in Dublin at one point. And obviously we have the you know, retired field marshal here reviewing all the troops in Dublin. And as he's walking around for the review, at one point he stops, leaves the official party he's going to, walks over to the crowd and spends quite a while talking to this, this ordinary member of the public, who it's later described had his Peninsula War medal on. Gosh. And clearly had bars for the same sort of campaigns. Now, the thought is that this might be someone who possibly even served under God. But it might just simply be a, 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 an old soldier who he sees with, with campaign medals for the same place as him. He goes over and he just basically, you know, stop the military parade. I'm going over to have a chat. Um, and it's that's just typical of the man, but also typical of the way he cared for his soldiers. Um, whatever you might say about his military leadership, his men loved him. Um, you know, not only because obviously he cared for them in this way, even if it was a rather paternalistic care, perhaps a strict care, if you want to put it that way as well. Um, they respected him because he never failed to put himself in harm's way as well. He didn't ask them to do something that he wouldn't do himself. Um, there's the famous, you, you, you probably know this and people watching will know as well, there's the famous white fighting coat that he wears into battle, which clearly marks him out as a target. There are even occasions in battle where he will ride to the front line and ride across the front line and away from the front line to deliberately draw the enemy fire off his men onto him. <laughs> I mean, he, he sometimes, you know, he gets bullet holes, etc., but very not really wounded himself. He didn't want to be one of his staff officers because a number of his staff officers were seriously wounded or killed because they rode with him when he was drawing fire from the enemy. And, you know... <sighs> I think that sort of sums him up in many ways. He was that sort of, of man. And that, and if anyone does, you know, buy the book, read the book, there's a number of little stories that show that sort of sense of um, care and that, that quite sort of whimsical sense of, of, of uh, he has as well in that, um, you know, he, he has a very Irish spirit. And I say that in a very positive way. So there you have it, guys. Goff was, as we know, a great warrior, but he was also popular with his men right up until the end. Don't forget to like, subscribe and comment to help this channel to grow, and we will be back on campaign soon.